Hey Wine Snobs, welcome to another edition of Wine Snob TV. Today for Wine Snob Calendar, we are celebrating Chardonnay Day. It's going to be a fun segment. Um, I'm having two guests on today's segment. I'm going to be featuring two guests. Our first guest is Eric Hiltz at Bin412. Um, I've been following this guy for uh, the last couple years and uh, I like his dedication to uh, what lays under the cork, what's in the bottle, um, diving in deep. And uh, if you think I'm a wine snob, then you'd probably, uh, you'd probably be a little surprised by uh, Eric. He definitely dives a lot deeper, which I like. It's kind of refreshing. Um, and uh, he, the wines he explores are most certainly off the beaten path, right up my alley. I think the first thing that caught my eye about his feed was the fact that he was tasting and reviewing unique artisan wines that I had been exploring as well out here in California. And mind you, he's on the East Coast. So um, that was really, uh, that definitely caught my attention um, that he was definitely uh, the type of wine enthusiast to dive deeper and, and venture further off the beaten path. So today he's going to talk to us a little bit about Chardonnay. So let's uh, cut over to Eric. Hey there wine snobs, thanks for having me today to take a deeper dive on Chardonnay. You know, Chardonnay originated in Burgundy, France, uh, but it's actually the product of two other grape varieties. It's a cross between Pinot Noir, which we know and love, and, and we know the Cistercian monks planted all over the hillsides of Burgundy, France, and a lesser known white grape variety called Gouet Blanc that grew mostly on the valley floor and was kind of relegated to the peasants of the time. Now one day, naturally in the field, a piece of pollen from one plant landed on a flower of another, uh, and created a new variety. Now the grape that grew would have still been Gouet Blanc or Pinot Noir, but the seed inside that grape created or contained a new genetic material that would eventually become Chardonnay. Now it still took an animal most likely to eat that berry and eliminate the seed somewhere and have it sprout and become, uh, you know, Chardonnay in a place that someone recognized it as a new variety. But interestingly, the things that just happened naturally in the field have now uh, created the, you know, one of the number one white grape varieties in the world that's grown everywhere and we've all drank for sure. Now Chardonnay, like its cousin or its, its parent Pinot Noir, definitely is highly terroir expressive. It shows where it grows. But it's also a, a wine grape that's known as the winemaker's grape because the winemaking style can greatly influence it. So let's break that down. Terroir, we mostly think of climate. When you think of Chardonnay grown in cool climate to warm climate, you're gonna range in flavors from more citrus to orchard fruit to eventually more tropical fruit flavors like banana or pineapple. Um, but then the winemaking style, so uh, do you age and ferment the oak, uh, the wine in, in concrete or in stainless to keep and preserve some of the freshness and acidity, or do you use oak to add some of that toasty component? If you use oak, are you using American, Slovenian, Hungarian, French oak? How, how toasty is that oak going to be, light, medium, or high? And then what percentage of new oak barrels are you going to use? Um, secondly, the malolactic fermentation process is something that all winemakers do in red wines, some choose to forgo in Chardonnay. It's a process, it's a secondary fermentation that takes tart lactic acid and converts it into a softer, rounder, uh, or malic acid into a softer, rounder lactic acid. Uh, and then there's batonnage, which is a French term uh, for stirring the Chardonnay as it's aging on those dead yeast cells, the lees of, the, of the, the, the dead yeast. And think about churning butter, right? You go from skim milk to whipping cream to butter. It's kind of the same philosophy. The more you stir that wine on the yeast, the more rich, the more creamy the mouthfeel is gonna, gonna get, okay? Um, now my favorites happen to be uh, those that are a little bit more elegant, a little bit more uh, you know, lighter bodied in style. Um, so it brings me to the wine that I'm enjoying today. Um, this is from Porter Creek Vineyards. This is the 2017 George's Hill. 
um, Old Vine Chardonnay. Um, now, Alex Davis, the uh, the winemaker here, is really what the French would call a vigneron, which translates to wine grower. Uh, definitely believes that great wine is made in the vineyard, spends an awful lot of time on farming practices and being very minimalistic in his winemaking approach. Uh, it also comes from a cooler climate part of California, the Russian River Valley. So every night, while it's warm during the day to ripen the grapes, every night a fog kind of settles into the Russian River Valley and cools everything down, shuts down the grapes, and preserves a lot of the natural acidity and the freshness in the wines. Um, as other California winemakers have emphasized power and heft and density in their wines, Alex was trained in Burgundy and takes a much more elegant approach to his wine. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the George's Hill. Uh, these vines were planted in 1980, original vines to the property. Uh, they're up on the top of an eroded hilltop, very thin covering of topsoil, very nutrient uh, poor, uh, doesn't retain a lot of water, so forces these vines to really dig deep and, and, and produce fruit, if any, and the fruit they produce is, uh, is very concentrated. This does go through natural yeast fermentation, uh, natural malolactic as well, batonage is, um, I think uh, twice per month, and then the oak regimen is 25% each in a light toast, 25% uh, new, one year, two year, three year old oak, okay? Yeah, now on the nose, just a, a really creamy lemon curd. Think like lemon meringue, creamy lemon. Um, and the oak while there and present is more like a barrel room smell. It doesn't have this really toasty in your face flavor. It's more like being in a barrel room. Very, very pretty. Really focused, um, a little bit of that citrus lemon zest, but a lot of apple pear kind of orchard fruit notes. Um, layered and creamy, a little bit of toasty brioche on the back end. But the amazing thing about this wine, it's only 12.2% alcohol. Uh, California standards, that's really low. Uh, there's an amazing acidity and energy to this wine that persists on the finish. So guys, listen, lots to learn about Chardonnay. Uh, I highly encourage you to go out and seek out examples from around the world made by different winemakers. Find out what your palate prefers. And, uh, and go explore. Uh, if you haven't had Porter Creek, can't recommend this enough. I think this is a great example of what great California Chardonnay can be when grown in the right place and made by the right winemaker. Cheers, winos. Thank you for that, Eric. That's a great Chardonnay, by the way. Porter Creek is one of my favorite wineries um, off the beaten path, Russian River Valley. I remember the first time I stopped by there a couple years ago and I really, um, loved the essence of that winemaker. Um, very small, understated, highly understated winemaker, uh, making some very exquisite small batch production wines. And uh, it was definitely a surprise when I saw it pop up on your feed and even you featuring it uh, tonight for Chardonnay Day. Um, that's definitely a pleasant surprise and it's nice to see a quality wine uh, such as Porter Creek, um, you know, get some attention. So wine snobs, definitely check them out and uh, uh, give them a go. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you have any other hidden gems as well, what's your favorite Chardonnay? Um, definitely let me know below as well if you'd like us to take a look at it. Um, now for me, my favorite Chardonnay is the Tara. I discovered this wine maker uh, a couple years ago and mind you, I'm not really a, into white wines, um, but this is the first Chardonnay I became completely enamored with. I liked how it represented the terroir um, and, and had these characteristics that you would often um, expect from say a, a red, like a Pinot, a very nuanced red um, or a Grenache. It had a lot of these earth notes to it and a lot of depth and dimension. And uh, as I went along, I began talking um, and uh, exchanging with um, the folks from this winery um, and learned more about this uh, Chardonnay. What I find most incredible about it is it's from the Atacama Desert. That's crazy. It's the driest place on earth. And <laughs> it's this some sort of passion project, R&D project by the winemaker um, and just getting the grapes to take root itself was a challenge. Um, so recently I was fortunate enough to sit down and have a very extended uh, 
conversation with the winemaker Felipe Toso um, uh, down there in Chile over Zoom, and uh, and he explained, told me the whole, shared the whole story. He shared the whole story of how this Chardonnay came about. Every vintage is different, um, and he uses employs different techniques for each vintage. Um, but at the core, it's all about the terroir and that unique expression and going back to basics. So he's in charge of making, you know, a plethora of amazing wines. Um, I, I'm yet to find a single one of their wines I don't uh, I absolutely love. Um, but this one is the unique passion experiment project of his. Um, and uh, so we're going to cut over to my conversation I had um, a while ago, uh, not too long ago, with Felipe as he explains Tara and the Chardonnay from Atacama Desert. Take a look. <laughs> Atacama Desert. <laughs> I'm still, yeah, it, every time it's, yeah, it's crazy. I, every time I think about it, um, how, first of all, how far is it from your production? That's far away. It's about, um, it's about 600 miles from the winery. So wow. It is far. By car, you go directly from the winery. By car, it will take you about 12 hours driving, more or less, because you have to stop. And this is an interesting photo because this is the Chardonnay. Let me look at that. It's a little bit foggy. You see it's foggy in the morning. Yeah. And you see something white in the soil? Yes. Yeah, that white thing is salt. Oh. Salt. Okay, salt. So that, that, that's some that's some of the, the, the crazy stuff. Here's I'll show you another photo. Here you can see a desert. I'll show you how you can see a desert over there. You see? Wow. Plateau, very, very dry at the end. You see oh. like some mountains, some hillsides. It's super, the only thing that is green is our vineyard. How, 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 how does it grow? <laughs> I, I, well, we, we grow because we have water. Huh? Usually if you see the analyze uh, of, this, of this, I'll show you another very nice photo. This was from a little bit far. Yeah. You see like a flat vineyard in between a desert. Yeah. <laughs> Isolated, huh? That's incredible. It's very quite incredible. So you, you can see a desert yeah, over there. It, it really is desert. Oh, it is a desert. It's, yeah. This is what we call the beginning of the Atacama Desert, okay? Yeah. Uh, because the Atacama Desert starts, this is the south part of the Atacama Desert. But if, if you see the wine, the wine is absolutely a little bit cloudy. We don't filter this wine at all. Yep. I, I like that. <laughs> I, I yeah. want I want as much as the as much of the essence of the wine to be preserved. So, but why why don't yeah. you why don't you filter it? Yeah, in this version, the sixteen is not so cloudy as others because it depends on each vintage. Because we don't do anything to it. It's, it's a wine that we do in a very crazy way. Um, you see, we have a river in between. Yep, it's a small river, but it's a Wasco River that also always has water. Uh. And when you see at the, uh, at the back of the photo, that's the Andes Mountains. Oh, that's right. So the water comes okay. down, you get that. Uh, the, exactly. We get water. Get snowpack. Over there, the altitude is like um, uh, like three, like 3,500 uh, feet. Yeah. 3,000 feet of altitude so is quite high. And we, you have what we call the, um, there's always uh, snow. So there's always water in the river. Because even in summertime, it snows. There's, there's, in January, there's, it's, it, there, there's called like um, the summer winter in January. That is a, a time that for some reason, it snows in January. That is our <laughs> summer. Okay, it's a summer. So we always have snow and then because of that snow, it, it melts and we have normally, we have water. So this river always has water. Uh, and because of this river, we can uh, irrigate and we irrigate in a very um, different way. If you would irrigate the drip irrigation in a normal way, what happens that your vines die. Okay. And that's what happened. So the first time that we planted these vines in 2007, uh, so 14 years ago, uh, we planted them in June. 
and then uh, they they died immediately. So the first time wow. we planted all the wheat, they died. But it was a very small experiment. We only had a one acre experimental acre planted. Uh, and then what happened is that we planted again, but with the um, consultancy of a, a viticulturist from the very, very north that worked more for table grapes, but understood the saltiness of the soils. Okay. And he told us, he explained us uh, how to really irrigate uh, this style. So you irrigate in a very different way. You irrigate like you have a big rain. Yep. Like instead uh, of irrigating for a few hours, four or five hours, you irrigate 12 hours in a day. And then at the next day, you irrigate again 12 hours or eight hours. Or okay. The most that you can irrigate, that you do like a type of flood irrigation, that you irrigate the most that you can. Instead of you start to lose water, you stop irrigating. And the next, the next day, you irrigate again. So what you do is you try that. A lot of water that really can go down, 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 down to the soil. So you can take down the salt in the soil, the most that you can, at least to one or two meters down. Okay. So your system can work with less salt. Then the salt go comes up very, very fast and you irrigate maybe a week or two weeks later, depending on the on the weather, you irrigate again. The salt comes back up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's so dry. Remember in, the, in this area, Brian, it's so dry that some years it doesn't even rain in the whole year. We're talking yeah. about the desert in the world yeah you know Brian funny thing the first thing that we learned in, in, in elementary school I learned <laughs> Go ahead. yeah it's the driest desert in the world that's the first thing we do so so it's fascinating thing because because it's such a wild area so extreme area it's very windy also so that's another stress for the plant very windy very salty doesn't rain in the morning is but the beautiful thing, we're just like 20 kilometers to the coast, 20, 25 kilometers to the coast, so very near. In that part of Chile, it's very, very flat. And normally near the coast in Chile, we have like, we have a coastal range of mountains. In this area, it doesn't exist. So we have a direct influence from the ocean. So yep. very breeze and windy. But in the morning, we have a type of fog that is called the Camanchaca. And this fog is thick fog that comes in the morning, really comes in the, at night, in the afternoon at night. Yeah. It is all night and it stays in the morning, maybe until midday. Wow. And then at day, the, the, the pressure temperatures change. So the temperature and that makes a difference of pressure and the fog goes out. And so all the afternoon from 12 to seven o'clock, you have a very nice sun. But the maximum temperatures are never too, uh, are never too high. Oh. Um, it's, it's like, a, um 26 celsius that would be oof, i don't know exactly right now that would be 18 20, 50s 60s 60 something yeah in the 60s yeah, yeah 70, 68 something like that wow like not, not warm. so it's not a very warm but it has because we're in the desert it's dry the, the gamma desert you have one of the cleanest skies in the world yep when you go to the mountains in the desert, not in this area, in this area because it's foggy, the sky is not so so clean at night. But in the mountain, just yeah. a few kilometers inland, uh, the skies uh, they they call that are clean about there's about 20 nights that the sky is not clean. So there's about 340 or 330 days a year that you have clean, clean skies. So that's why today Chile in this area is one of the most important areas for for astronomy. Astronomy, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's very important area. So it's a very clean area, very small population of people. So it's a very unique place. It's very very simple. It's not a, you know, it's not a very posh area. It's, it's a very yep. simple and simple area. Um, it's very beautiful. So it, this wine a little bit reflects its intensity, but one of the coolest thing is that long, long time ago, millions of years ago, this was a forest area okay so in this area long time ago uh we had the river was huge mm -hmm. it's a very very river uh and so where we just beside the river that our vineyards are just beside the river this is a uh, full of uh river stones very round stones 
Uh, and it's also calcare. So limestone, it's full yeah. of limestone. So the beauty of a Chardonnay that is cool weather, uh, a little bit foggy in the morning, in the, in the afternoon, bright, bright sky. But the most important thing by far is the soil. So this limestone soil full of stones. So you can feel the tension of how we make the wine. So this why we make it in a very natural way. We make it, we press, because it's a very small production, we press it with our feet. <laughs> Whole lunch. We press it with our feet over in a bin. We put below another bin that has some holes. We press it with our feet. Uh, and we have a very low and very soft drain. Yeah. So normally you have like, from what we say one kilo, you have a bottle here, you have about half of that. So very low efficiency from the grape to, to the wine. And because of that, the leaves are very, very soft. So what we do is that we take this wine immediately to barrels and we ferment in stainless steel barrels because we don't want any influence of any type of a concrete or barrels. And we are a very clean fermentation, but we ferment with the, all the leaves. So we never do a decanting. Normally a white wine, you, you, you press the wine, you turn a tank, you decant for 24 hours, you take the big leaves out and then you ferment a little bit more clean. Here you ferment like in the old days, no decanting, everything together. So what we wanted to do is a very natural type of fermentation. We don't add yeast, we don't correct acidity, we don't add sulfur. Oh wow. So we start like a natural wine, okay? So nothing, just where it comes from. And then we keep this wine, well, especially the 16 is, this vintage is 100% stainless steel barrels because today we have been evolving. Uh, Tara is always an experimental project. So we're always evolving and changing. I'll tell you after I show you some photos about where we're evolving. But this year is 100% stainless steel barrels, about 250 liters. But this wine was 30 months in the lease in the barrels. Oh, wow. Why do we do it that way? Because this wine, when you taste it at the beginning, it looks like a, a base of a sparkling wine. It's super, super active. We're talking about a pH of 3.1. Mm -hmm. So very, very high acidity. Yep. And we like to grow this wine, to, to, to nurture this wine um, that doesn't have any oak flavors, but we work with the leaves for 30 months. Okay, so that's two years and a half. Not every week. No, we like every at the beginning, you know, the first six months we, we move more of the wine, then we leave it and then maybe we taste the wine once a month, we take the lease up. So very clean that never had any sulfur on it. And only before we bottle, we do a little bit of sulfur for the bottling because this wine travels around. You have to sterilize around. it, yeah. Yeah, but but just a little bit, not 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 too much. It is truly an experimental wine from, yes. the, from the vineyard, the concept of this vineyard in this very obscure region, all the way through the winemaking process, you know, going back to fundamentals, but in a very almost purest way. And, and we did it in the more purest way now. We have been involved because when you find an area that, that your terroir, your origin, you don't know exactly what you're going to have. So at the beginning, if, if you see this wine, it says Tara, of course. Yeah. This Tara, white wine number one, doesn't say the variety immediately. You have to go like yep. this side where it says base wine Chardonnay. Okay. Uh, and we, we put it Tara because the place where, where we are, Tara is a, is a, is a name of a of a um, native tree, a small tree, we are, but it's a very important area in the Atacama, near the mountains, that is called Tara also. Um, so those are the meaning of the word, you know, and also it's the name of a woman. And also in Spanish, Tara means something very difficult. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, it sounds like it's really pretty difficult to get to one of these. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and the other thing that we do bottle this by hand, so we don't use any machine. The idea, this is when, when you work in some projects, uh, Brian, you want to learn as a winemaker that you've been trained and formed in top wineries to do the wine with your, by your hands, like in the old days. Like it would be like a, like a garage wine, you want to see experimental winery. 
So when I remember my first vintages, when, when, I, when, I, was, when I, was in, I was in the university, I had to make wine at home. You know, like a small crust of grapes yep. at home, pick it in your in your house and then put it in your refrigerator, like when you do beer at home. Yeah. Well, I, I think the fundamentals, when if you know how to do from everything from the beginning, so we wanted to go to ba back to basics, but it starts very experimental because the first time that uh, it arrived, the grape, it arrived two buckets of grape for nothing. You know? <laughs> A few pounds of grapes. So how do you do a few pounds of grape? I remember, okay, when I was in university, I crush it with my hands. I press it with my hands. Yep. I put it uh, in, a, in, a, in a big jar of glass. I put it inside in the laboratory. You know, so that's how we started Tower the first that's time. That's right, made... because your first harvest is going to be very small, almost, almost useless for most people. Most people would just throw it away and they'll keep waiting until the harvest grow vintage over vintage. That makes exactly. sense. So from the beginning with two buckets of harvest from this vineyard is when you started Tara. And, exactly. and you, can't, you can't fire up all the big machines and all that to get to, to make two buckets of grapes. So yeah. over the years, you just stuck with the process as if you were making two buckets of grapes. <laughs> exactly. That's how, that, that's how we started. That's and awesome. That is, so, and it's beautiful because it makes everyone. Also, the beautiful thing about Tara that is, it's harvested at the beginning of the of the vintage because in the north, the yield, the crops are very very low because everything is a little bit more extreme. So you have half of the yields, you know, have very low yields because of that. The maturity is a little bit before because the weather is a little bit more north. Everything is a little bit earlier. You have much more light than in the south. You have more hours of light. So this is harvest at the end of February, beginning of March. So these are the first fermentations. So everybody, we, we always hire um, a lot of winemakers to help us in the vintage. We have we, we hire about six to eight winemakers and we hire specifically two winemakers to work at what we call the, the, the experimental uh, winery. Uh, that's how we call it, is where we have everything that is very, very small. And that part, Tara is done. So the first wines that we make, there's no other grapes, premium grapes coming inside. Is the, that whole winery is absolutely alone for Tara. Wow. So it's a very time because nothing is harvested at that time. Yeah. Uh, just so then we start to harvest like in mid March, things like that. So between the last week of last two weeks of February and the first week of March, everything is harvested alone. So very nice to to make Tara. It's a privilege. I, I love it. I'm. Uh, it's this is it. It's a privilege for me. I. I, um, I never thought I would actually be find a Chardonnay so attractive, and now it all makes sense. Understanding mm -hmm. the process and the story behind it, um, and that this was actual. This is an actual passion project of um, of you guys of yours. Um, the last question that I keep keeps that keeps coming back to mind is. Why, of all the places in Chile, make amazing wines? <laughs> Why Atacama? Six hours away. How did that happen? Okay. No, 12 hours away. Oh, 12 hours away. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, did that, how did that happen? Isn't that incredible? Who would have known Chardonnay had so much nuance and complexity um, and so much story behind it? I think uh, after this exercise, I definitely have found a, a new, ex new appreciation for Chardonnay. Um, I'm definitely going to be looking further into Chardonnay wherever I go and uh, seeing what, uh, what's out there. Um, I love the very unique terroir driven um, expression in this Chardonnay and the Porta Creek as well. I had that when I visited the winery. And uh, I remember distinctly, I think I had some rough notes I took. Um, but uh, there you go, wine snobs. Um, what's your favorite Chardonnay? Share it with me below. Um, join the conversation. And uh, if you'd like to participate in one of these segments, reach out to me on Instagram. I'm going to leave links below um, to uh, Eric's channel, Bin412. Um, be sure to check it out, follow. Um, and also join his conversation. He does these food pairings 
um, uh, every so often uh, where they feature unique wines with some artisan chefs as well. And I cannot wait until I can get to the East Coast and uh, join one of those uh, pairing dinners. Um, until then, wine snobs, cheers.